uh, I wanted to start off with something that I thought might actually be of questionable relevance, but I've actually just found that it's more relevant than I thought. But I wanted to start with a kind of quote uh, that doesn't have anything to do with Paul Mogensen <laughs> or Dorothea. But uh, a while back, I was working on translating some texts by the Italian artist Gino De Dominicis and his interviews and statements and so on. And in one of them, he says um, uh, something to the effect that all works of art are contemporary. And he compares it to the idea that if you see a car from the 1920s, coming down the street, you don't say, well, I can cross the street anyway because that car is in the 1920s and I'm in the 2020s. Uh, the, the car is there in the present and the works of art are always, if they exist, they're always with us here in the present. And so he says, um, that's how artworks are. They're always live. And the reason I wanted to start with that was because when I was looking at this show before and seeing works from 1965 through 2022, and it was so striking how all of them seemed equally contemporary to me. All of them seemed equally present, or in, in the word that Dominici used, live. Uh, now I've actually also found out that it's relevant because Paul likes to collect classic cars. So, <laughs> so that car coming down the road that's going to run you over if you think you can cross the street might be, might be his. Um, and uh, one thing I noticed is that when Karma published the book on your work uh, a few years ago, uh, in the main body of the book, they didn't give the dates of the work. They had them kind of hidden in the back uh, in small print. Yeah, that was my request. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I thought that was really interesting because of, of this idea that they could all be simultaneous in the present. I do that because I find that the dates are dis a distraction. You know? People look at the date and they don't look at the painting. You know? It's a visual thing, you're supposed to be looking at it and not other information. Mm -hmm. So um, do you think that the, the order that you made them in doesn't, uh, doesn't have relevance to how we not, look not, at them? Not to me. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's interesting because for me there's a sort of, uh, both of, somehow there's both of these things simultaneously. They, they're all present, but they all have their historicity and they all relate uh, to a moment when you had the inspiration to, to do that. And why did someone have that feeling of wanting to do that then? Uh, you know, somebody in the 19th century couldn't have thought of doing, doing these paintings. Right. Uh, it made sense for somebody in the 60s or afterwards uh, to do them. Exactly. Um, and in a way, that brings me to, uh, I think, the thing that the two of you have in common, which is the, the Bikert Gallery, which is, you know, the gallery that introduced your work uh, both here and in, in New York and in general. And I don't know if it introduced your work, Dorothea, yes. but it, oh, it also was your uh, start. I mean, I think that was, a, you know, an amazing uh, thing when we look back on it. I mean, I have like a partial list of some of the people who showed in the gallery with you uh, to David Novros, Bryce Martin, Ralph Humphrey, Barry LeVay. Uh, I understand that Linda Benglis was the secretary. Well, tell us a little bit about Klaus Curtis and the, the gallery and how you became involved and in your sort of introduction to New York. Well, Klaus Curtis was going to open the gallery and so he asked David Novros to suggest somebody. Uh, and David was going to show somewhere else, so he wasn't going to do it. So David suggested to Klaus that he should look at um, my work, Robert Duran, Bryce Martin. And so Klaus got in touch with me. I was living in Los Angeles, you know. And he invited me to come to New York um, from that. So I was given a show before I got here. You, know. you, so to speak, moved to New York in order to 
exactly. take part in the gallery? It wasn't just a question of shipping work across the country. I, to... I, I had some work and I showed it to him, but I didn't show that in the gallery. You know, mm -hmm. I made all new work and he gave me money to make it when I got here. So I started from scratch. And Dorothea, do you, were you there? Do you remember that? Uh, I, I, was, I came, came later. I came into the gallery in 1968. When did you come in, Paul? 66. Oh, there you go. So I came in later, and uh, my story is sort of charming, if you want to hear it. <laughs> I was working for Rauschenberg, and, Bryce, and I couldn't do all the work, so I hired Bryce Martin to be Bob's curator. And so I was always answering the phone with Klaus Curtis, hmm. and because he was trying to get hold of Bryce, and uh, eventually, and we kibitz on the phone a lot. He had a good sense of humor, and after a while, he said, "Well, what do you do?" And I sort of shyly said, "I'm a painter." And then he said, after another while, he said, "I'd like to come to your studio." Now, I, I was just working my ass off all the time. I was supporting a child as well as myself, and uh, I didn't realize that everybody and their dog was trying to get into this gallery. It was the hippest gallery in town. So I said, "No, you can't come see my work." <laughs> and then he called about six months later. They said, yes. And he came and he told me to condense some of the panels I was working on. And I did, and I called him back. And he. Well, what does that mean, condense the panels? To, to join them. Ah, uh, to put Clear them closer. Them. Yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, make, you know, it was too spread out, in other words. The concept was too spread out. Mm -hmm. And so um, he came and saw the work later and asked me to be in the gallery. By that time, I was, you know, the thing that we have in common is we have a mathematical background. I have a doctorate in mathematics. Aren't you impressed? I am. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 of course, Paul studied mathematics before going into art. And, but, you know, the way it comes, the way that our in our background in math comes out is so entirely different, but so intriguing to me. The way because when you really know mathematics, it's a hell of a lot of fun. It's not what you learned in school. I went to an English girls' school in Montreal, so I had no mathematics. And then I went to Blackmont College, and I walked into the math class, who was being taught by this genius, and I fell in love. And, as I say, eventually got a doctorate in mathematics. Uh, but so we have this in common. So the, it always so if you're a mathematician, you're a geometrist, of course. So the way in which you use mathematics emotionally, and I say mathematics is emotional if you're doing it right. <laughs> you have fun with it, and it's emotional. And so that I see that in your work. I, I look on your work, Paul, as extremely emotional as well. The way you put the parts together and the way you use geometry, I just get pure emotions from all your work. I always have. I wrote a statement. <laughs> it's in your cellar. Ah. Paul Mulgensen art intrigues me because it is deeply emotional. Now, he has profound met methods to, to penetrate his emotions. His knowledge of geometry is remarkable, as is his use of it. However, his use of it is not predictable. He takes what might call a list of nuances, which are both geometric, unexpected, and deeply emotional. When I look at Paul's paintings, they teach me something about him and about myself as well. I first met Paul when we were both in the now legendary Bikert Gallery in the late 60s. We did not uh, become friends, but I think we admired each other's work. I live in close proximity to Paul's studio in Soho. Uh, every once in a while, I visit his painting studio, which always is crammed with work and very, very small. When I am there, as opposed to mine, which is huge, uh, when, I, uh, when I am there, he does a magic act. 
from his crammed small studio, he brings out rather large paintings which have been stacked one against another, one at a time, of course, so I can see them. He will also go to a rather small drawing table and show me a portfolio of new drawings he has made. Often he will talk to me about them and how they came about. It's always hard for me to look at drawings which are not on a wall. However, when he shows me work like this, both paintings and drawings, I'm continually, emotionally, and profoundly moved. Thank you. <laughs> anyway, I, I uh, use a lot of mathematics because where I grew up in Los Angeles, I was expected to take mathematics in school because there were a lot of aircraft factories and other factories there, and, and all the factories wanted all the students to know math because they all run on mathematics. So it wasn't my choice. That was what I was told by my teachers. You know? And it worked out very well. I could do it. So um, it got me a um, scholarship to university and stuff. So. And who, oh. who, who were the, or what were the first artworks that deeply affected you? Um, yeah, I've been asked that, and I don't really know, except I realized that when I was a little kid <clears throat> uh, in my grammar school, we used to get in the school bus and drive into LA and look at the Southwest Museum, which was a 200-year-old collection of American Indian artifacts. And we were not, we were told this wasn't art. This was artifacts by Indians, you know. But of course, that was what I saw, you know. And that's the only thing I ever saw for years. Mm -hmm. So when I first saw a European painting, it was like 10 years later. You know? mm -hmm. And what about, uh contemporary art that was going on in Southern California. I was curious if you saw, uh, like let's say paintings of John McLaughlin or Carl Benjamin or uh, those abstract painters that were there. I, I was not interested in anything done in Los Angeles. Uh -huh. As a matter of fact, at the university, I had a professor of art history who was from Harvard and she knew I wasn't gonna stay in Los Angeles. So for my graduation, she gave me a New York City subway token. <laughs> Your, your, your fate was already decided. Yeah, I was out of there. <laughs> and then the biker brought me here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Which is not the little bit that the biker to Cali, because it was really interesting. Klaus let people do anything they wanted to. And one artist, I think, was Bill Bollinger, who did a, just a, a cone of graphite in the middle of the main sh uh, main room, main, main showing room. And it, it was about eight feet high, and it was just graphite. And it was just, that's all there was in the gallery. And it was just beautiful. Do you remember that? Yeah. Yeah. And it just blew me away. And, but every show there it was stunning. All the artists were geniuses. It was just amazing. The work Van Buren did then was spectacular. Yeah. But many, I can't even remember names anymore. Well, that of was Bryce Martin's a genius. Yeah, that was because of Klaus, you know. I know. And he would meet an artist and see what they were doing, and then he would give you a date, you know. <laughs> yes. You know, he didn't want to see what you're going to show. He just knew when you're going to show it, you know. Mm -hmm. And it came as a surprise to him, you know. And he always accepted it, you know. Like when I had my first show, I had sent some things from Los Angeles, and I decided not to do that when I got to New York. So I made my things were very different. And so when they were shown, he hadn't seen anything like it. And what he did was he took me to dinner in Central Park that night, and he asked me where all this stuff came from because he'd never seen anything like it, you know. And of course, I was not forthcoming. So. <laughs> Anyway, he was, he was great about it, you know? If you had been willing to be forthcoming, what would you have said? <laughs> <laughs> How'd you get along with Klaus? Fine. Yeah. Yeah, he was great, I thought. You know? Yeah. Like, the last show I had there, which was 10 years later, I showed large, brightly colored spiral paintings, which was completely different from what I'd been showing before. <clears throat> and he never mentioned anything about the show, you know? Not a single word. 
<laughs> That's encouraging. But, but then I found out later that he was going around the country telling everybody how great the show was. You know, he didn't tell me that. You know, which is fine. So you and he were equal in the incommunicative uh, category. I think he was more communicative than I was. You know? Okay. Okay. Yes, he was pretty communicative. Yeah. Actually. Okay. Yeah. One of the paintings was 102 inches in diameter, mm -hmm. and after the show. He put it into this tiny office that was there. <laughs> and it filled the entire yeah. office, you know. And he sat in there with his giant painting for months, you know. But he never mentioned it. You know? Obviously he liked it. So. What happened to the painting? It was finally sold in California like ten years later. You know? To a private collector or museum? Private collector. Mm -hmm. How many shows did you have there? Four solo shows and maybe a dozen group shows. Yeah. Yeah. And then a group, he got, he did group shows from all over. He showed Agnes, I was in a show with Agnes Martin, and I think you were in that show too. And nobody knew about Agnes Martin much then, you know, so it was just totally beautiful work, of course. Yeah, he did a lot of group shows. The, yeah. the first year, he did a show with uh, <clears throat> Mangold, Agnes Martin, Bryce Martin, David Novros and me, yeah. Mm, beautiful. Yeah, that was the last show of the first season. Mm. I think when I think about a lot of that work, including your work, uh, what it seems to have in common is this fact of being, whatever it was, it was bluntly that and with no, nothing extra, yeah, just absolutely. a- Absolutely, yeah. No and a kind of absolute statement. No adjectives. <laughs> no adjectives. Very good. Yeah. 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 I like that description. <laughs> I read a few years ago that somebody said my work was blunt, and I realized they actually were looking at it. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's not blunt. Well. <laughs> <laughs> at all. What What do you mean? What I mean is that when you look at Paul's work, it pulls you in. Mm -hmm pulls you into the shape and the emotional depth of the work. It just you just go into the painting of the side. Yeah, I think that's that's the color, you know. We talk about math. No, it's right? not. Well I, it's the way you apply it and the shape you okay, do. Yeah. But anyway, I really care about <laughs> color a lot. And then we just, we talk about math all the time, but I don't think about math you know, very much. I mean I know how to do it. But the whole purpose of it is for the color. So, so what else could we talk about? <laughs> I think we covered everything. Else. I think we covered well, everything. Well, I think there's a bit left. I mean, since we're talking about color, I, uh, there's a curiosity I had about the fact and, and how it's applied that in the, uh, the earlier paintings, the paintings from the 60s, the paint is acrylic or... Um, or enamel, and then at a certain point you switch to oil paint. And uh, you know, obviously you can get different qualities of color with those kinds of paint. What was it, what was it you were looking for that made you switch? Well, <clears throat> I had tiny kids, you know. You had what? Tiny kids. And so, and I was working where the kids were, so I, Stop using anything that had fumes to it. You know? mm -hmm. so I'm I sorry, I didn't oil. hear the word anything that had what? Fumes, you know. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I use oil paint, but I didn't use turpentine or anything. I just add oil to the oil paint. You know? So there's no fumes at all. You know? huh, okay. And that was for the safety of my kids. Mm -hmm. you know? and although I benefited from it also. So. And then there's a big difference between color when it's one color, you know, and color when it's uh, multiple yeah. colors. Yeah. It's, it started out with one color in separate parts mm -hmm. all over the wall. Mm -hmm. And then actually Klaus said that uh, there were too many nails uh, to hang up all these parts you know, after oh. the show. So then I started <laughs> doing it on, on one. You know? And to get that same thing, I add different colors to it. You know? So, so the, the move from the, like a piece like this, three, 
three panels with the ratio between them and the wall really becomes part of the composition. Yeah. Uh, you know, to, to ones like these was as much a practical thing as yeah, anything exactly, else. Yeah, yeah. No, Glenn said there was 32 nails in the wall for one painting, you know. Uh -huh. And after the show, that was a little bit too much. Plaster walls. Yes. Ah. <laughs> do do people have questions uh, from the audience? There's one straight away. Just curious, stuff, like like these like orange paintings like that. I said you're trying to make the color statement. Um, like how do you arrive at you know the next big orange painting? You know, what's the ratio? Or, you know, that just kind of comes to you, or is that through a process of working over you know years? Or, well, I have all this stuff in my head. So um, <clears throat> the arithmetic or the math, you know, is pretty obvious. Mm -hmm. And then I just paint it all one color, you know. How would you decide on orange? I think part of it, I found that people don't like it. You know? <laughs> and I've done that a few times with like, purple and yellow and stuff like that, which I really like a lot, and other people don't. Hmm. So I think that's a pretty good idea, actually. Go against the grain. Well, yeah. Spit in their eye. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Can we pick up for a minute in terms of what you guys were just talking about in that change that, you know, Cross got upset about the older damn parts. Mm -hmm. and they are two different things, right? When you've got three separate things on the wall, or you have one. Yeah. And how do you feel about that? I mean, for you, what's the difference? I don't. I don't see it as different. Yeah. No. No. It's just another, another version. Uh, uh, it strikes me that the, the way that the separate panels was an invention that had a lot of influence. Probably. Yeah, I got a lot of uh, opposition from that when I showed them. Uh -huh. <laughs> what kind of opposition? That's interesting. Well, <clears throat> some people wondered what I was doing, and that's all. That's normal. <laughs> and some people didn't like it. That's normal too. <laughs> and some people felt I was leaving out everything that they thought was important. <laughs> <laughs> Which I think is a good reason for doing it. So. Yes. Joe, yeah? You know, I just happened to be reading this old art form this morning, and there was a Jeremy Gilbert Rolf review of a show with Bike Arts that um, Paul was in. And one of the things he said was that the separation of canvases was a kind of drawing. That was what the drawing mark of paintings were. And um, then there was this other conclusion that had to do with the fact that he wasn't sure about the paintings. He just like was undecided, but he thought that um, they had a kind of authority. And you know, you're talking about mathematics, but there's also, if I'm not mistaken, there was a kind of training for a while in chemistry. And then there was also um, something to do with the piano, if I'm not mistaken, also. And I'm wondering if, <laughs> even though there's this kind of uh, uh, decisions for all the paintings that had to do with measurable things, that that's the kind of knowledge that's embedded in the work, is the fact that your education was mathematics and chemistry and music, which were all kind of miserable and abstract things outside of, you know, fine arts uh, Well, th th these things don't have one source, you know. Can you elaborate on that? Well, they come from a lot of different things, you know. That's vague. Well, I mean, I could be vague, I guess. I want you to be specific. <laughs> No, it's not specific. It just, there's multiple sources. And if you do it right, it all looks like it belongs together, you know? That's too vague for me. What do you mean? What kind of multiple source? 
uh, uh, well, specifically it. mathematics or studying color or integrating chemistry, you know, and our music. And there's all these yeah. different, all these disciplines that I uh, was placed in, you know, mm -hmm. by my situation with my family or the school or whatever. You know? So mm -hmm. I learned all that stuff, you know, mm -hmm. and then you end up knowing all this stuff. And then what do you do with it? Because it doesn't really agree with each other. You know? Can you say something that will make it understandable to someone like me who never studied chemistry what what could have been in chem chemistry that would somehow find its way into well, in what you do room, there's a copper painting you know <clears throat> and people talk about how shiny it is and so forth which which is not why I did it you know when I made those I had all these parts that were that were all separated and when they're hung on the wall, they look like one painting, although they were not, they're all disconnected, right? Mm -hmm. And then I decided that I wasn't just gonna paint them colors. Since I knew chemistry, I decided to make each one of these paintings some material from the periodic table. Mm -hmm. So uh, that one was copper, and the others mean. were carbon, and I did other ones. Oh, okay. So. That's a beautiful concept. Mm -hmm. Thanks. I didn't know what else to do, so. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> it's interesting that some of your, a lot of your work is or has no title, specifically, but then some of them, they really do have a title, and the titles are so, they have such an interesting story behind them. And since you mentioned the copper painting, I wonder if you want to share the reason that it's called Copperopolis. Well, I went with a friend to the mother lode in California, <clears throat> which is the area where they found gold in 1848. And in the southern part of this area, which is in the Sierra Nevada mountains, they didn't find gold, they found copper. You know? So they had copper mines there. So they found a little town. And when I was there, it was a ghost town, it was all gone. But they called it Copperopolis because that's they found copper there. So, And it's like Indianapolis and Minneapolis, Polis is a Greek word for town. So that was common in, in America to name towns uh, Opolis. You know. So Copperopolis was what somebody a long time ago decided to make up, and I thought it was a great you know, title for stuff. You know. It was a copper painting, and I'd been there. I decided to call it that. And after that, I stopped titling my painting. So, you know. but. Then how did you come up with not untitled the way everybody else does it, but no title? Well, untitled is a title. You know? It's capitalized and underlined. And there's even a place called untitled. You know? So obviously, I didn't want to do that. Okay. <laughs> I, I, don't, I like to leave it blank, you know. And nobody wants to do that, you know. Like, I was in a show a few years ago, and... I think there's there's four artists in the show, and every artist was uh, giving their artist statement, right? Which I don't do, right? And I asked them to, uh, in the paper with all the statements, put my name down and leave it a blank so that or people know that I didn't say anything. Mm -hmm. They did, so I thought that was great. You know? yeah. When you were in those in those copper mine areas. Did you look into how copper was mined? This was a ghost town. I know. But and everything that was going on there was all gone. You know? I see. Yeah. I see. Mm -hmm. So there, I didn't see any mining. You know? Yeah. And okay. I think all the copper had been mined and that was gone also, so, mm -hmm. which is why it was a ghost town. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, speaking of industries, exciting towns, um, you did grow up in an industrial area where there was a lot of the kids and uh, factories and that application of how they, you know, create cars and machinery, it influenced how you apply to paint. Is that right? Well, I bought the paint from the same suppliers. Right. <laughs> I, I started out by buying paint by the gallon, you know, which is how they sell it in industrially, you know. And all of my first paintings were all spray painted. And I came to New York, I stopped spraying because it was my kids, you know. There's a lot of fumes involved with that. But in Los Angeles, you spray outside and everything just evaporates, so it's not a problem. But in New York, you're always inside, so it's, it's 
different. Yeah. And it was your father also had a great team. My father actually uh, learned how to spray paint. You know, <clears throat> he was trained in a nursery in in Denmark, and so we came to America, and he took all kinds of different jobs, including a lumberjack, and then. He moved to Los Angeles and, and married my mother, who was also from Denmark. They met in Los Angeles. Um, and then the depression came and nobody had any work. So uh, six years later, he got his first job, which was spray painting machinery. And that's what he did the rest of his life, you know. So he showed me how to do that, you know. And I still have the spray gun. Someone back there? Um, what kind of cars do you like? Sir, cars. Like? I didn't hear the whole thing. What kind of cars do you like? Yeah. Anything? Oh. I have a 57 Chrysler New Yorker, a 57 Oldsmobile, a 47 Plymouth, a 37 Plymouth, and a 1938 Lincoln Zephyr four door convertible. How did you get them? <laughs> I would just like sell a painting and then I'd see an ad. I just go buy it. Yeah. <laughs> it's all completely random. You know? Is there something that all those cars have in common that is your automotive aesthetic? Not really. It's all completely random. You know, what was available at the time. You know, uh -huh. another time I was looking at a a, um, a sales uh, sheet for racing parts. And I saw that there was an Offenhauser engine which is used at Indianapolis, you know. Somebody was selling it. And I just sold the painting, so I, I bought it, you know. So I have an engine also. <laughs> <laughs> Are you still doing that? No. Mm -hmm. About the drawings, the drawings you said that you showed your portfolio, so I'm just yeah. You know, you have an idea, you make a sketch, then you make a drawing, and then a watercolor and a painting. You know, to me, that's too much work. You know, so I decided I just do the painting. I don't do the drawings. And then afterwards, if somebody wants a drawing, sometimes they'll take on after the fact. You know? <laughs> You don't, you don't think anything through ahead of time? You know, I think everything ahead of time. But, but not, not, not on paper. I don't need to draw it out. I have it in my head. Okay. Anybody has a question? Yeah. Um, I just wanted to ask you about music. Um, were you accepted to play the piano? Yes. Um, and that was just part of the Danish way, right? Like, that was Copenhagen. Yeah. Yes. And I thought it was yeah. yeah. So there were years of. I spent yeah. five years playing classical piano. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and what made you quit? You were old. I didn't want to be in front of people. Mm -hmm. And have you been? Have as, you been? as I got better and better, I had was expected to perform in front of people. So I'd be there'd be an audience. I'd be playing like Schubert or something, you know. I mean, I could do it, but it was my mother's thing, not mine. And one day I asked her if I could quit, you know, she said, okay, and so I did. Yeah. And then 20 years later, we were in a house in Maine. <clears throat> we were farm city for somebody and there was this a baby grand piano. Who's we? Your mother? No, oh. you know, my family, my kids oh, and everything. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, there was nothing happening that day. So I went to the piano and I opened a piano bench and I found all the sheet music in there. And I found a Rondo by Ramo in there. So I put it on the piano and I played it, you know, and then I played it again. And then I put it away and I haven't thought about it since. That was about 30 years ago. I like it, but you know, I don't want to perform. You know. Do you still appreciate music? Do you still listen to it? Pardon? Do you still listen to any type of music now? I listen to music all the time. Yeah. Yeah. 
Did not possible again. Sure, I listen to that also. Yeah. I I went to the Yale Summer School of Music and Art, <clears throat> and the the level of students was very high there in everything. And in the music part, there was a daily performance, a chamber concert of like a duo or a trio or something like that. I used to cut my painting classes, go listen to the music. So I, I still listen to it, you know. Who's your favorite pianist? I, I don't really care about performance, you know. Uh-huh. Yeah. Do you have a favorite music? Uh, I, I listen to like a hundred different kinds of things, yeah. When I was a little kid, my mother would always listen to classical music. And then in the garage behind the house, my dad would be listening to country and western. <laughs> <laughs> so I got both of them, you know, as, as equal, you know, so. Yeah. Yeah, Paul, I'm, uh, I'm curious about what you said, that like, you just have the image in your head and you can feel the need to make preparatory sketches to uh, realize it. And I'm curious about, well, I'll do that, but I'd like to ask you a similar question. I'm curious if there was any, if there's ever any struggle to get the, what you, and I'm curious if you see it in your head, if, if how it comes in your mind, if there's a struggle to make it realize, if, it, if it's not a struggle. I don't think about what it's going to look like. I think about the process for getting there, you know, the color, the materials, the, the arithmetic, whatever it is, you know, and then I just make it from that. And I don't really care what it looks like because it, it what it looks like is a result of my thinking about it. You know? So I never have an image of what it's gonna look like when it's done. You, know? uh, you you have an idea of what your the process that you're gonna go yeah, through to yeah. I know produce it. And I work completely differently than Paul. I was trained in, at Ecole, the Beaux Arts in Montreal. I do lots of studies for work. Huh. And I figure things out slowly, very slowly, and I do a lot of accompanying meeting that I'm doing at the time, which is usually pretty heavy. So I just am completely off it. I'm not spontaneous in any way. Completely off this. I remember once uh, seeing a, a documentary or something with an interview with Agnes Martin, and I was really shocked at what she said about how she made her work, because she said she saw the painting in her mind completely before she made it, and so it was inside her head, and therefore it's basically about the size of a post she postage stamp. That, yeah. And then she had to figure out how to make it five by five feet. And um, I was so taken aback, because I really would have thought she worked more like how you describe how you work, that she, has a thing that she wants to do, and then what you see is the result of that. It's, it's so interesting how, how different, I mean, it's obvious, but you know, uh, how different people's methods are in that way. I, I met her early on and talked to her for a while, and she was a very strange person who looked at everything. I met her too, and I agree. Very, <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> she was really not of this world. She interacted with people in a strange way, or not at all. She preferred not at all, I think. But at the same time, she was completely aware of everything that was going on in the art world. And she lived in the Adobe house that she built on the top of a mesa in New Mexico. Go figure. <laughs> yeah. Can you speak up there? Yeah, it looks like look, there's two things. The nature of the show is that the work is you know, it's all a continuum in a way. But I'm wondering if you think that there's been a kind of progress in the work or not. 
I didn't hear that last word. Do you think there's a kind of progression in the work from the new, the old work to the new work? It's, it's not intentional. I just do each one as it comes up. So. so do you think personally that there's, there's been a progression? Well, you can be self-deceptive, you know? I had a big show in uh, Houston years ago and it had almost 90 things in it. And I remember every big change I had made over the years, you know? And when it was all up, it looked like one guy did all of it, you know? Mm -hmm. So I was just kidding myself, you know? <laughs> Is that it? There must be one more ama amazingly, <laughs> <Like> brilliant, <that. laughs> amazingly brilliant question, and here it comes. Um, Walter Robinson once said something to the effect that uh, the artist Tony Smith was capable of giving mass healing, and that's sort of something that Dorothea said about you, that you are capable of you know, bringing healing to something that's otherwise orderly and, and uh, impersonal. I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts about healing and how it enters or comes out of this comes as a complete surprise to me. That's because I think, I don't mean to speak for you, but because I think that the artwork and your feelings are all the same thing. Yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah. 